January 5th. They took my brother from me. Today marks two months. My brother been gone. So, so basically, when my brother said, hey, protest with police. When I found out, my older brother sent me that text. I was up. I was up. How many niggas did he have Two weeks. Up. No sleep. Waking out my sleep. Trying to find some type of peace around this thing we call society. My man was 19. He was 19. I don't, I don't know of this man that was Pac-Man, whatever his name is. I don't like to speak on it because of anger and emotion. But I want to let you know myself, man. I'm 19 years old. I'm 19 years old. That was my older brother. And I say myself, like, as a young black man, I'm proud. I'm proud to stand because you know, because man, you black yourself, bruh. Ain't no way. Ain't no way you taking lives like that and not feeling that when you go to sleep, bruh. Because you took my brother and I couldn't sleep, bruh. That's different. That's different. I mean, it's the system got you, brody. And all I have to do is pray for you, bruh, because the anger in me, y'all know, the anger in me. It take everything in me just to even say or even feel. To even just be black. To be black. A lot of people out here, they feel the same rage I feel, man. And I do appreciate every single one of y'all because we out here for my brother. Vincent Belmonte was shot and killed by Officer Larry McDonald on January 5th, 2021. The Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigations has concluded its analysis of the incident and shared a report with the city of East Cleveland. That report has not been made public or shared with the Belmonte family. McDonald claims that during a foot chase, Belmonte turned around, pointed a gun at McDonald, and threatened to shoot him. This allegation was echoed by East Cleveland Police Chief Scott Gardner. Male spun around, made a statement that officers were going to have to kill him. Uh, he reached for the gun, and our officers fired an undetermined amount of rounds. And, and at that point is when he uh, draws a firearm from his belt and points it at officers while making a statement. Vincent was murdered. He was shot in his back. He was shot in the back of his head. I struggle to find how someone fleeing law enforcement is a danger to law enforcement. I struggle to understand how it is that a law enforcement officer who has a known record for his deviant behavior can be given, that was on probation at the time, can be given the benefit of, a of the doubt and be so supported by the city of East Cleveland's mayor, their law director, the chief of police. And before we examine the shooting, let's first consider McDonald's credibility by examining some of his recent history with the department. McDonald is unaffectionately known throughout East Cleveland as Pac-Man due to the people and property he and his squad gobble up through seizures and arrests. On August 3rd of 2019, McDonald and dozens of other officers in the department were identified as having severe deficiencies in their training by legal watchdog Chasing Justice, headed by Mariah Crenshaw. On January 7th, 2020, McDonald was given a 10-day suspension and placed on extended probation for one year after offering to release a woman from jail in exchange for a date with him. Ten months later, on October 2nd, McDonald attempted to take home some pot seized as evidence in an arrest conducted by Officer DeMarco Johnson. The incident was recorded on Johnson's body camera, and after he realizes he's been caught, McDonald went on to verbally threaten Johnson. 
when they when they are killed. You want you you want to have killed. Okay. The only discipline that McDonald received for this infraction was a demotion from commander to sergeant. This despite being on extended probation. East Cleveland City Council Vice President Juanita Gowdy has been the most outspoken critic of McDonald. At a council meeting on December 17th, Gowdy demanded a direct assurance from Mayor Brandon King that McDonald have his body camera on at all times. So I need you to make a commitment that Larry McDonald have the body camera on every time he leaves this building. I will, I will make that's, a commitment. That's policy. And, that, and oh yeah, that every is time policy. he interact with the public. That's policy. That's policy that he has that on. So we will okay. speak with the police tomorrow to make sure that that policy is uphill. So if I see him right now, he should have his body camera on. That's what you're trying to say. If there's an interaction and he is in uniform at work, yes, he should. Okay, thank you. Despite Mayor King's assurance, the policy was not upheld. Less than three weeks later, when McDonald pursued and killed Vincent Belmonte, only three seconds were captured on McDonald's body cam that day. Now let's examine the facts as we can discern them from the body cam footage of two other officers who were on the scene that day, McDonald's partner and DeMarco Johnson. McDonald initiated the pursuit when he claimed he saw Belmonte's car traveling at a high rate of speed. McDonald's partner turned on his body cam at the beginning of the pursuit and it remains on for the duration. Belmonte's car hits something that causes it to catch on fire, at which point he and two other occupants run out of the car. McDonald pursues Belmonte on foot, which is when he activates his body cam. In the final frame of McDonald's footage, Belmonte can be seen climbing over a fence. McDonald's partner runs parallel to McDonald behind another house in an attempt to cut off Belmonte. Some yelling can be heard, followed by four shots fired over the course of one and a half seconds. McDonald's partner runs up behind McDonald, who is standing several feet from the fence. Officer Johnson arrives moments after the shooting, approaching from the opposite side of the fence. Where you at? Now, if you wish to avoid seeing any disturbing imagery of Vincent's final moments, you can jump to this time code in the video. Otherwise, we're going to get into nothing too graphic, but you will be seeing Vincent's body lying on the ground. There are two important things to note from Officer Johnson's vantage point. First, Belmonte is lying on his stomach, facing completely away from McDonald. Second, there are a significant amount of dead trees and branches between Belmonte and the fence, which would have required several seconds for him to get past. Johnson begins investigating the scene and asks McDonald where the gun is. Where's the gun, Sarge? Sorry, That's a firm. That's a firm. That's a firm. Go ahead. Johnson affirms that he can see a gun and then runs back to his car to get gloves before he inspects Belmonte further. Give me some, a, give me some gloves. Cole, give me some gloves. Give me gloves now. The gun is not visible on the body camera until Johnson rolls Belmonte completely over. From the footage, it appears to be half inside Belmonte's left side hoodie pocket and Johnson has to shake it a bit to knock it loose. <laughs> Later, Johnson would confirm this when his yeah. captain arrives. The gun was in his front hoodie pocket. Cell phone or anything? Uh. The four shots fired into Belmonte can be observed at various points during Johnson's examination and match up with what Channel 19 reported on a copy of the autopsy that they obtained. One bullet to the right rear of the head, one into the right forearm, 
one into the right lower back, and one into the right side of the chest. From this point forward, Johnson is focused on keeping Belmonte alive. You want us to load him in the car? Hey, you want us to load him? Hey, Cap. Oh, here go. You, you want us to load him in the car and roll, or you want us to get him in the car and roll? No. no? Cole, you stand here with him. Yes, Keep your eye on him. Yes, Keep him comfortable. Yes, sir. What is the fire department doing? At several points, he is audibly frustrated with his fellow first responders. The vehicle on fire is Hey, LT, you need, a, you need a cot. You need a cot ASAP. Yeah, you gotta pause him. No breaths, actually. Trust. 3182. These motherfuckers take all day, boy. At one point, he even takes initiative to retrieve a crash cart from the ambulance himself when the EMTs are arriving on the scene without one. Y'all need to roll to do something. Grab a cot. Go, you take that. Here is the official narrative on the East Cleveland Police Report for that day. The subject did flee from police in a stolen vehicle on foot, produced a concealed firearm from his person, and pointed it at a uniformed police officer. Vincent's family and activists find this story difficult to believe, considering the angle that Vincent was found on the ground, the direction of the gunshot wounds, where the gun was found, and the reputation of East Cleveland police in general. Whether or not one sees the evidence differently and believes McDonald's story, it is indisputable that McDonald failed to comply with East Cleveland's body camera policy, which he had been singled out for directly by the mayor and city council, all while he was on extended probation for previous infractions. At the city council meeting following Belmonte's death, Chief Gardner gave a selective presentation of the body cam footage going out of his way to make excuses for McDonald's deactivation of his body camera and why it could have happened. Well, I mean, again, our, our internal investigation is, it has, has nearly just begun, but I mean, again, looking at what happened, the, it looks like Sergeant McDonald activated his body camera and then shortly thereafter deactivated. And there's a common occurrence that that happens. And again, this appears speculating on my part, I'm not trying to speak for Sergeant McDonald, but I mean, there's a common occurrence with our officers and the style of body camera we have, especially when you are in a, a situation where your adrenaline is going, you're running, you're fighting, you hit the body camera and there's a series of three beeps that, that are emitted. So the only other way to make certain that your body camera is activated is to physically look down and look at the body camera itself to see if, if the, a light is going on. And again, when you're running, uh, that's probably not the most advantageous thing to do. So most likely what happened was Sergeant McDonald activated his body camera. He did not hear the beeps because he was running and he, he went to hit it again, thinking that he was activating it for the first time. On May 31st, Vincent's family and friends were joined by a coalition of organizers fighting for police accountability in Cleveland. And I need people to understand, I need people to know that black lives matter. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. We are sick and tired of the militarization of our communities when it comes to police. They are able to murder us and go back to work. If somebody at Walmart would murder somebody, they wouldn't still have their, come on, come on somebody. They're able to murder on camera, right? They're, they're able to turn off their camera. Pac-Man, we talking about you. Yes, come on now. Come on. You took somebody's life, Larry McDonald. What we need folks to understand is that we have our own local George Floyds and Breonna yes, Taylors. Yes, yes, we do. We have to keep that in mind. That's right. All over the United States. We got them, exactly. We got them all over. We've got a shared problem with regards to police unaccountability. Mm -hmm. yeah. They are unaccountable, they kill with impunity, and it's time to put a stop to that shit. 
So when we talk about what we're here for, we're also here because there's a reason why we ask other victims of police violence and their families to come here today. We have to start to build community even amongst them. Yes. Nobody knows their loss, their trauma, better than those who shared in that loss and that trauma. Amen. And so we got to bring them together. But we also, as a community that might not be as impacted as those family members and as those victims, we've got to come together as a community and we have to support them. We have to protect them. We've fallen very short on amplifying their voices. Yes. But there's no excuse for that anymore. Yes. The fact that you're here, I, I want you to look at it like this. Everyone leave here when we're done. And I ask that you take on the responsibility of bringing others to this struggle, each one of you. My brother name was Craig Lamont Bickerstaff. He was killed by a Cleveland police officer named Raymond Chipkis. He too was shot five times in the back. He was 27 years old. So I've been fighting it for almost 20 years. It'll be 20 years, January 26, 2002. You have my deepest, deepest sympathy for what has happened to you. So we have this ballot here today. If you're here and you're if, if a city resident, I wish the whole county could sign it. But it's a ballot initiative for Cleveland to amend the charter. So if you're a Cleveland resident, you're here today, you're a registered voter, we urge you to sign this petition, please. We need 7,000 votes, but we're going for 10,000. Yes. This is going to ensure justice for our loved ones. See, I'm going to just say this. Alicia, I tried and tried to stop them before they killed Angelo. I tried and tried to stop them before they murdered Brandon McLeod. They get younger and younger. My brother was 27. But damn, he was a grown man. And you shot him five times in the back. He too was run away like Arthur Keys and this young man named Vincent Belfonte. He was running away, but they, he got shot anyway. And I have family members that's a part of the, unfortunately, the law enforcement system. I have family members. So I know how this is supposed to work. And this is not the way it's supposed to work. It's supposed to be equal justice, not split justice. Okay? It's supposed to be equal. And it's one-sided. But like the gentleman just said, it's good for you guys to come out. I'm glad to see you. But we need you behind the scenes. We need you when the cameras are not here. We need you when the crowds are not here. We need you at the table and engage and engage these changes and these policies in the system. Because if we don't have it, we're going to keep getting the same results. And we're going to get the cop who killed your baby. Absolutely. And we're going to get the cop who killed all 93 families' babies. Absolutely. Because enough is enough. Yes. I am sick and tired. I am sick and tired of the city of Cleveland, the city of East Cleveland. I'm just so sick and tired of all over the states, the mother and our babies with no accountability, no nothing. So my sisters and brothers, I want to tell you today, stop calling these people law enforcement and police because they are not. Under Ohio law, they forfeited that authority and that privilege when they didn't take their mandated training. And so we found it's a statewide issue. It's not just in East Cleveland, but what we also found is the bad actors flock to East Cleveland. The whole department is white. Yeah, yeah. There's not a good apple in the bunch. Yeah, yeah. And so stop calling them law enforcement. They are impersonating police. Yeah. And we are not just holding them accountable. We are holding Michael O'Malley, the Cahoe County prosecutor, who has known this before anybody else knew. Wow, wow, wow. And he continues to prosecute my black people yes, that are being yes. slain, yes, that yes. are being brought into an unjust system. Yes, yes. He must be removed yes. from office. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Heather McCullough, who serves as a city prosecutor, knows she must be removed from office. Yes. Willa Hemmings, who serves Hold as the city law director, got stuck up. 
Judge Richard McMonagle, I done made him mad. He stood up in court, jumped out his seat, yelled at me and screamed at me because I was speaking his name. Oh, well, no. I'm going to say it again. Richard McMonagle yeah, must be removed yeah. from his seat. Patrick Gallagher and Euclid hid the fact that Euclid Police Department, especially Louis Catalani and Matthew Rhodes, who murdered Luke Stewart, he, he covered it up. My God, call him out. He covered it up. He got stuck up. Gotta go. Chasing justice is no longer about holding the police accountable. We want the prosecutors. The Belmonte family has been crying out for justice for 10 months now. The case currently resides with the Ohio Attorney General's Office of Special Prosecutions, and they are the ones who will ultimately decide whether or not McDonald will be indicted and charged for the killing of Vincent Belmonte. Thank you so much for watching, and please remember to share I am 100% independent, which means that I rely on you for amplification and, if possible, your financial support. Uh, I can only devote about half my time to researching and producing stories right now. I'm less interested in, in reaching enough subscribers where I can support myself honestly than, than I am in being able to start bringing on outside help because I have a lot of things in the queue and, and I just can't follow up on all of them as much as I'd like to. So I'll be continuing to track this story and others coming out of East Cleveland in preparation for the next season of the documentary series I co-produced with Black Lives Matter Cleveland and director Roger Glenn Hill, State of Injustice. And last week, the final episode of our pilot season, which is focused on Euclid, Ohio, was premiered on The Real News Network, who is streaming all three episodes of our pilot season now. The last one is entitled Patrol and Control, and we set out to show the extent to which black residents in Euclid routinely find themselves over-policed in their homes, in their schools, even in their skating rinks. And that premiere was followed by an excellent panel with BLM Cleveland members and Tara Stewart, who is the sister of Luke Stewart, the gentleman killed in the very first episode that we um, set out with State of Injustice, and we go into a deep dive into how Luke died. Spoiler, it's very tragic. I am as proud of the work that I have done on State of Injustice as I am intimidated by the work that is yet to be done uh, and needs to be done exposing the systemic abuses and corruption that are endemic in Ohio law enforcement which is all to say that I, I am very proud and I am very intimidated so with that I'll go ahead and do one of my uh, if you haven't been here before I'm, I'm very big on um, the awkward exit my script just kind of rolls out and then uh here I am, just saying things while the little subscribe stuff pops up, so.